Okay, this sermon's entitled, Hezekiah's Prayer. I'd like to open up with prayer, then with a few verses. All right, dear God, thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says. Bless the listeners, I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you turn to Isaiah chapter 7, right before we see the uh, the prophecy of Jesus Christ being born of, of a virgin, if we back up to verse 9, we see an example of um, Ahaz, who does not want to ask God for a sign, but yet the Bible says that he, he, you can ask God for a sign when it comes to you know, certain things that have to do with prayer and whatnot. It says in verse 9, And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is uh, Remaliah's son. If ye will not believe, surely ye shall not be established. Moreover, the Lord spake again unto Ahaz, saying, Ask thee a sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height, above. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. Now, basically, he thought that asking God for a sign was something that he shouldn't be doing. But see that this is not correct. It says in verse 13, and he said, hear ye now, O house of David, O house of David, you know, is it a small thing for you to weary men? But, but will ye weary my God also? Now, what this is saying is that God does not get wearied. God cannot get tired at all. You can't overpray to God. You can't pray too much. In fact, it's impossible. And it's not there's nothing wrong with asking for a sign. Of course, in this in this account, the sign was, you know, Jesus Christ. Okay? You know, it says in verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. But see, we're going to go back to the the account of Hezekiah, King Hezekiah. And we're going to take a look at his prayer. It's basically his prayer of, of healing or deliverance. Now we can go to Isaiah chapter 37 and take a look at you know this very you know story, and it's actually worded the exact same way as is Second uh, Kings chapter 19 and verse one. It's the exact same verse. And believe it or not, if you jump down to like verse four, that's when the, that's when the the rhetoric uh, kind of shifts into you know or starts talking about different things. But it's pretty much the same story. So we're going to look at Second uh, Kings chapter 19. And let's take a let's take a look at that account, and let's try to you know correlate some significance to this prayer with how we should pray as Christians, as believers. He kind of sets a paradigm in many ways. So let's turn over to Second Kings chapter 19, and let's look at Hezek- uh, King Hezekiah. Second Kings, and let's start off with verse one. It says, okay, let me see, where, where are we? No, we're going to start off with verse 14. We're going to start off with verse 1 in chapter 20, but right now let's start, let's start off with verse 14 of chapter 19. It says, And Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. So what, what does this represent? This represents laying your request before God. Okay, now... This is a letter basically proclaiming that he's going to die, I believe, and he's only 39 years old. So obviously he does not, he's too young to die, and he's going to have to pray to God that this won't happen. So in verse 15 it says, And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord, and said, O Lord, God of Israel, which dwellest between the the cherubims, thou thou, thou thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. Now, he's addressing God for who he is. He's not just calling out to some generic God. He's calling out to a specific God, the God of the Bible, the God of Israel, okay? The God who created the heavens and the earth. So whenever we pray to God, we should have the same type of reverence. We should, you know, pray out to God the Father, okay? In the name of Jesus Christ, his Son. So that kind of tells us how we should pray. Now look at verse 16. Lord, bow down thine ear, and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes, and see, and hear the words of, you know, Sennacherib, or Sennacherib, which thou hast sent to reproach the living God. So basically he's doing the same thing David did in the Psalms. He's, he's giving a supplicatory prayer. He's telling God or petitioning to God to you know, lower, lower his, you know, his ear. You know, bow down thine ear and open your eyes so that you can basically see what I need and hear my supplication. So that's another example of how, you know, how we should pray. And then, of course, in verse uh, 17, it says, Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations and their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they have destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord, our God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand, 
that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. Now, let's just stop right there. Now, jump over to chapter 20, and let's find out, you know, here's more about, you know, about whenever he gets sick, he ha- let's, let's, he's going to pray again here, and we're going to see, you know, some things about this prayer. Now, we, we, we know that he's got a malignant sickness. It's not something that's basically, you know, curable, as we would understand it. It's something that's, you know, it's a, it's a sickness unto death. So it reads in verse 1, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. So he's telling him that you're getting ready to, getting ready to die. But see, a lot of people in this case would just give up. But King Hezekiah did not want to give up. He, he realized that you know, the only hope he has is to pray to God. And this basically sets up, you know, sets an example for us. Sometimes that's the only thing we can do. Sometimes we're in such a predicament that the only solution is going to be prayer. Or it's going to be, you know, brought about by prayer. So we're going to see the importance of prayer here. Now it looks it reads in verse tw- in verse 2, then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord saying. Now, this is significant as well. Whenever they would turn their face to the wall, it was basically a prayer of of privacy. It was letting God know that you're the only person I'm talking to, and you're the only you're the only one that can help me. So he was not praying in a way that was you know ostentatious. He was praying in a way that was very private. That's why it said he turned to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, "Now here's the prayer: I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in in thy sight." And Hezekiah wept sore, and that actually means he wept, you know, copiously, or he just wept profusely or whatnot. Now, the reason why he's, he's, he's reminding God of how he walked and stuff is to let, because this is the basis of, of getting the prayers answered, you know, is obedience to God. And it's not part of salvation, of course. We're saved by grace completely, and God does all the work. But see, it, it's important how a person lives, because if, you're, if you want your prayers answered, you're going to have to walk upright. You're going to have to, you know, obey God and do what he says. And that's why he says, I have done that which is good in thy sight. So, because of this, God's going to answer his prayer. So now, he, he goes on to say in verse 4, And it came to pass, after Isaiah was gone out into the middle, middle court, and the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, that's because he was the king, that he's, you know, that's why they call him the captain of my people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David, thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. So it's not a bad thing to, to pray tearfully, because that's an, effect, an effective prayer. So when you're actually, you know, very serious about the matter, and you're praying, you know, in tears. Behold, I will heal thee on the third day. Thou shalt go up into the house of the Lord, and I will add unto thy days fifteen years, and I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. Now, it goes on to say in verse 7, now Isaiah is making a point here. He's telling them, you know, to, to do something in regards to the, to, to, to the prayer. And what this tells us is that whenever you're praying for something, have faith that God's going to answer it and act as if he's going to. Act as if the answer is in the offing, or it's just impending, and, and, it's, and he's going to answer it. So he, he says, it says in verse 7, And Isaiah said, Take a lump of figs. Now, this obviously was to make some type of a bedding. Take a lump of figs, and they took and laid it on the boil, and he recovered. Now, we're going to stop right there in terms of the prayer, but let's take a look at verse 8. And this tells us that it's okay to ask God for a sign, because a lot of times... When, when a person's praying for something, it would help to get a sign, some reassurance. And this was Old Testament. They didn't quite have all the, all, all the scripture that we have that tells us every single one of God's promises. So they had to kind of rely on, you know, God giving them signs. So Old Testament you know, saints had, had, had it a little, a little bit differently than the New Testament. We have God's word telling us, you know, the beginning from the end. They just had to rely on a sign. That's why God spoke directly to lots of the, of the characters in the Old Testament. You know, he spoke directly to Moses. He spoke directly to a lot of characters. My point is, this is different. This is, it worked differently back then. So you can ask God for a sign, and the sign would confirm 
that the prayer would be answered. So let's look at verse 8. It says, And Hezekiah said unto Isaiah, What shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me? See, Isaiah is already declaring he's going to heal you. In a, you know, in a, he's going to heal you in a, in a, in a few days. And you're, he's going to add 15 years into your life. But see, he wanted a sign that confirms this. So it says, The Lord will heal me, and that I shall go up into the house of the Lord the third day. So in other words, you're going to be healed in three days, but he wanted the sign. And Isaiah said, This sign shalt thou have of the Lord, that the Lord will do the, the thing that he hath spoken. Shall the shadow go forward ten degrees, or back ten degrees? Now obviously, we're, we're talking about a sundial now. My point is, he, Isaiah confirmed to him, King, Hez, King Hezekiah, that God will give you the sign. Now, the point of this is, I believe wholeheartedly that if Hezekiah had not made this prayer, he probably would have died. So what this is, what this is telling us is that prayer matters. It matters to God. It, it just matters, period. So it's very neglectful to not pray. You know, we should pray you know, before meals. We should pray before you go to sleep. We should pray before you're getting ready to endeavor in some type of missions trip or whatever. My point is, prayer can prevent horrible things from happening. It can, it can prevent you know, the, the, the situation from, from getting, it can prevent it from getting worse. Uh, the, we, prayer is for healing. It's for all sorts of different reasons. The point of this story is that he didn't have any choice but to pray. So God answered the prayer, and that's why it's important to pray. It's important to pray um, very effectively and very, you know, like I said, seriously, and gravely. So let's turn over to James and let's look at one last verse. The reason why I wanted to bring this, all this stuff, you know, out was because it, it sh we should be making this as an example for how we pray. You know, pray directly to God. Pray in, you know, in, you know, in privacy, you know, in silence. Jesus Christ said, don't pray with vain repetition. Okay? Like the heathen do. So, he sets, he's setting a good example. We should pray, you know, wholeheartedly. So let's turn to James and look at one more verse on this. Obviously, the verse is, is a very familiar verse. But I just believe that you know, a lot of things happen in this life that, that don't need to happen. You know, people get in car accidents, and I believe if they would have just prayed for safety, you know, per, perhaps, that, that maybe they wouldn't have gotten in the accident. See, that's why it's, it's, it's very remiss to neglect prayer. It's very remiss to think, well, no, I'm okay, everything's fine, everything's gonna, everything's, you know, in the works, everything's gonna happen just fine. That's not the way we should, we should, you know, view prayer. We should view prayer as something very important. It's, it's a, it's a conduit that takes us right to God Himself and allows Him to hear us, you know, our, you know, our petitions and whatnot. And then He answers our prayers, and then we, He talks to us through His Word. So, like I said, you know, we should pray to God because it keeps the, re the relationship recipro reciprocal. The Bible makes it very clear in verse 15, James chapter 5, And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another. So the Bible's not just telling us this for no reason. He's telling us to confess our faults one to another. That's how you get right, you know. That's how you, it's like 1 John 1, 9. Confess your faults to God. That's how you restore your, your fellowship. And then it tells us to pray one for another that she may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It's talking about the believer. The believer is declared righteous. So prayer is very important. And that's the reason I wanted to preach this sermon is let people know that it's something we should do, you know, probably more so than what we already do. And it makes a, it makes a difference. So yes, I believe that Hezekiah would not have been spared uh, if he hadn't, you know, prayed this prayer. And then, of course, he got the sign and the, and the, the prayer was answered. He recovered. He was healed. So that's all I have. I just think we should take prayer more seriously and not just pray three times a day, but pray, you know, when, when any, anything comes up, any type of problem or any type of, um, you know, dilemma or, you know, a, a trying situation. We should just pray basically like the Bible says, without ceasing. So that's all I have. Let me close in prayer. Dear God, thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for allowing us to see what it says on this important subject. Bless the listeners, I ask all this in Jesus' name. 